Uh, our next presenter is Philip Oldfield. Uh, Philip is a lecturer in architecture of University of Nottingham in UK. Uh, he coordinates the master course in sustainable tall buildings and uh, other related high-rise architecture program. Uh, he's been an editor and a reviewer of many uh, international journals, including Journal of Architecture and also CTBUH Journal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Philip Oldfield. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm, I'm Philip Oldfield. I'm a lecturer in architecture at the Department of Architecture and Built Environment, University of Nottingham, where I convene a quite unique course called the Master's Course in Sustainable Tall Buildings, which is a dedicated course and qualification focused on the typology. So let's try and work this out. There we go. Um, I think it's worth noting at this point that a lot of the content of this, of this um, presentation has evolved out of collaborations with some of the students on this course who are from a variety of international backgrounds and from around the world. So one of the things we try and promote is not only tour building design via the studio, but also getting students involved in tour building research as well. Um, I'm going to talk about three things today. Firstly, I'm going to talk about what is Passive House? So what is this lecture all about? And then I'm going to look at a bit of research we've been doing at Nottingham, um, examining are there in, any inherent qualities to tall buildings that make them um, relevant to Passive House design? And finally, I'm going to finish off with some student projects that um, some of the students on my course have evolved. So what is Passive House? What am I talking about? What is this lecture about? Well, Passive House is basically a construction standard, and it can be applied to any typology, it can be applied to any function, but it basically is where thermal comfort <clears throat> is achieved to a maximum extent through passive measures. So, for example, internal heat gains, the appropriate orientation of the building to maximize solar gain, um, use of mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. And the compliance says that a building can be considered passive house if its heating and, and cooling requirements are less than 15 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. So a pretty low energy um, quantity there. And passive house buildings are typically characterized by six criteria. Firstly, they're super insulated. Very high performance thermal facade, typical U values of glazed areas of about 0.8. Uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin, and of opaque areas about 0.15, so very high performance facade. The use of mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, so recovering any of the lost heat that is ventilated out of the building. The careful exploitation of solar gain, so using orientation to appropriately capture solar gain when necessary. Um, compactness of form, air tightness, and the minimization of thermal bridges. So why build Passive House? Well, one of the major um, advantages is reduced energy requirements. Uh, passive House buildings, as compared to traditional buildings, have been shown to have significantly reduced energy demands, particularly for heating and cooling, as uh, kind of shown on this graph here. And that creates comfortable internal environments with reduced heating and cooling um, energy requirements. So, over the past 20 years, about 25,000 buildings have been constructed which have been uh, deemed passive house compliant. And this is, these are what they look like. There's very few tall buildings that have even attempted to tap into this performance requirement. Uh, most of the buildings are low-rise, detached buildings, the occasional um, low-rise apartments, but most of the buildings look like this. Now, why should this be? There is one, however, exception to this, and this is the only passive house building completed today, and I think this was touched upon in some of the lectures uh, yesterday. This is a power tower in Linz. Uh, completed in 2008, it shows a number of kind of interesting design strategies and technologies which improve its sustainable performance. So, for example, it has no air conditioning or traditional radiators. 
The building is conditioned mostly through the use of uh, ground source heat pumps. Um, it has 46 150 metre uh, boreholes drilled into the ground, makes use of the ground's warmth, makes use of the ground's uh, cool. Uh, and these are distributed via a, a water system uh, through chilled ceilings, as you can see there on your right. It also has a very interesting facade, 60% um, glazing, 40% opaque panels with a very low U value, um, 0.6 watts per meter square Kelvin. And this is only achievable via it being quadruple glazed, which is a very significant amount of glazing. Um, zooming in a bit more detail, it uses uh, strategies such as prismatic blinds to bounce um, a certain degree of light. Um, higher and deeper into the office space, but at the same time reflect away unwanted light. But as I say, this is only achievable via four layers of glass, and one can't help but think, you know, what is the embodied energy um, implication of this? What is the cost implication of this? And maybe this is one of the reasons why there are so few passive house tall buildings. But with all this in mind, you know, myself and some of my students started to ask the question, why are there no passive house tall buildings? Is there any qualities or any characteristics of high rise that lend themselves to this criteria, that lend themselves to this de design philosophy? And key to this thinking was the idea of surface area to volume ratio across different typologies. So if you consider four typologies of residential uh, living, detached house, terrace house, low rise residential, and high-rise residential. As a typology changes, the surface area to volume ratio, the compactness of the building changes. So a high-rise building is five times more compact or has five times less surface area per unit volume compared to a detached house. And our thinking was, well, if you've got less surface area, how does that impact heating? Does that make the building or will that make the building easier to achieve passive house compliance? Um, so we took those four typologies you just saw, uh, terrace house, detached, low-rise residential and high-rise residential, and we gave them all the same facade, the same amount of glazing, the same U-value, the same performance, and we ran them through PHPP software. Now, PHPP is essentially a sophisticated Excel database uh, that calculates the degree days of the building, uh, and it'll tell you, A, whether the building is passive house compliant, and B, give you figures for heating requirements and how often the building overheats. The results proved to be pretty interesting, actually. Um, as shown in this graph here, the blue is the annual heat demand for the four different typologies. And it shows the annual heat demand for the residential was significantly lower than the other typologies due to the reduced surface area to volume ratio, the increased compactness of the building. Yet, the flip side of this coin, the red, the overheating, showed that the high-rise was significantly more likely to overheat. So for 13.5% of the year, the high-rise building, the passive house high-rise building, um, overheated. But the interesting thing for me was the relationship between heat demand and compactness. Uh, this is a graph showing surface area to volume ratio along the x-axis and the annual heat demand along the y-axis. And it shows there's a clear correlation between surface area to volume ratio and heat demand. And there's a clear correlation between typology and surface area to volume ratio. So in this sense, tall buildings can be seen to have an inherent advantage over some of the other typologies in terms of annual heat demand and in terms of meeting passive house criteria. So when some people come along and they say, well, tall buildings, yeah, they're inherently unsustainable, that's a very simplistic um, look at the situation. And there are inherent advantages, such as compactness in um, high-rise design. Looking at the heat gains and losses in a bit more detail, um, you can see in the, in the detached building, uh, the majority of the heat gains come from the solar gains. It's up there. This is actually the boiler. Um, so that's the kind of artificial heat gains. The majority of the passive heat gains come from solar gains, so from the sun. Now, as you get down towards the high-rise building, the majority of uh, heat gains in the high-rise come from the internal gains. So, in fact, 60% of the heat gains in the tall building um, come from the internal heat gains. 
So that's things like people, equipment, hot water pipes. And this has been shown in practice as well. When um, There's been a few examples of low-rise apartments completed uh, that demonstrate passive house criteria, and they're finding a significant percentage of overheating due to hot water pipes being insufficiently insulated. So in internal heat gains is obviously a challenge. One other thing we did as well is we, um, as I say, we kept, for the four different typologies in this study, we kept the thermal uh, performance of the facade the same throughout. So they all had the same level of glazing. And this was based on typical passive house criteria. 40% um, of glazing on the south, 20% on the north, 2% on the east, and 2% on the west. Now that's obviously not a standard tall building kind of curtain wall. So again, looking at this and comparing on your left, this is a passive house glazing on the tall building. And on your right, this is assuming a curtain wall with, say, 75% uh, opacity. And you can see the difference. While the heating is still low, the heating is still 3 kilowatt hours per meter squared, the building in this situation would overheat 44% of the year. And it's worth noting this is still a triple glazed solution. So this is still a very high performance facade. But in this situation, it would overheat 44% of the year. And a lot of that is down to not only the solar gains, but the internal heat gains as well. So what are the conclusions from this? Well, firstly, tall buildings do have an inherent advantage um, in terms of having an efficient surface area to volume ratio as compared to other typologies, which can potentially reduce heating demand. However, the overheating and in particular internal heat gains will pose a, a challenge to those who attempt to uh, design passive house tall buildings. And in addition, glazing or the amount of transparency in the building facade needs consideration. Obviously, there's got to be a balance between daylighting requirements and the thermal performance and overheating of, uh, of high-rise. Um, the kind of second half of this presentation is looking at some of the student projects that have evolved out of this research and out of the studio which I run. Um, I was approached about a year ago by a, an organization called ISA Visangaban and asked if I w wanted my students to take part in a competition to design a 65-story passive house compliant skyscraper in New York. Um, and I said yes, uh, little knowing what was to come. Um, the site for the competition was, um, as I say, in Lower Manhattan, and it was quite a high-profile site, uh, stone's throw away from the World Trade Center, um, and it's at the entrance to the Battery Park Tunnel, um, so 60,000 people in cars drive past this site every day. And here's a site in context. So as I'm sure you all know, this is a site of quite high-profile historic urban fabric, as well. I'm going to go through a few projects now, and it's worth pointing out um, before I show these that these are student projects. These are students working in pairs or threes. Probably the first time they've ever attempted to design a tall building. Um, and when I show you some of the utopian ideas that are surrounding these, please bear in mind these are, these are student projects. Um, but the first one is called the Manhattan Sky Podium. And again, this is by uh, three students. And their idea was inspired by the idea of community, recreation, and social sustainability at height. Um, they wanted to tie in the kind of activity of the Battery Park and bring it into the site. But instead of the horizontal, they wanted to bring this greenery up into the vertical as well. Uh, and they were inspired much by Marina Bay Sands, uh, things like the Empire State Building, the kind of the vibrancy and activity you get when you bring yourself up above the city. So their concept was to create a significant public space at height above the city. Uh, this is a development drawing, and you can see some of the ideas using existing buildings and escalators to kind of step up to create this podium in the sky. Uh, so this podium bridged together three different towers and created a significant public space, a space of community, recreation, social activities, high above the city, 120 meters above the city. And there's pretty much what they thought the experience of this kind of space was going to be like. But they didn't stop there. They went on to program 
how this, build, how this space would be used throughout the year. So for example, taking inspiration from the Rockefeller Center, they wanted to freeze the kind of ground and have it as nice skating uh, ring in the winter. But while this is a utopian idea, for sure, um, it's rooted in uh, real pragmatic considerations. So to create a significant podium in the sky, you've got to consider the structure. Uh, we were lucky enough to have input from Arup, Rogers, Sturk Harbour and partners and other uh, key professionals in helping our students develop considerable pragmatic uh, solutions, such as a structural strategy for this. And the challenge always was with this competition was marrying the kind of environmental passive house ideas with interesting and innovative tour building design. Um, so in terms of the building, the orientation and organization of the different functions, the uh, residential, the hotel, the office, was organized to make use and in consideration of um, environmental requirements. So the residential and hotel, which would have benefited from some additional solar gain, went on the south. The office went towards uh, the lower floors and benefited on the north and was shaded by existing buildings. Students then developed you know, detailed plans, worked out where the super insulation went, worked out how to organize a plan such as bedrooms and living rooms benefited from solar gain. And also looked at the systems involved in the building, you know, the, the geothermal systems, any heat storage for use over the winter as well. Um, and that's the kind of project in context on the site model. The second project I'm going to talk about a little bit is called the Stack Sun Spaces, again by three students. They were inspired by the only passive house building in the UK at the time, which was a two-story building. Um, this is a Denbydale passive house uh, in the UK. And it has this um, south-facing sun space, which became the kind of social hub for the house, and it also helped benefit from, from uh, some additional solar gain in the winter months as well. So their question was, can we reinterpret this, this idea that happens over a two-story building into a 65-story building? Um, can, they, can we create a south-facing atrium which could be the social hub of the building with compact, highly insulated passive house units? Um, Right, um, positioned behind. So uh, this was the section and the uh, 3D view of the building and you can see the idea was to, uh, to create these social kind of sky gardens on the south facade and they would help shade some of the spaces behind but also help capture uh, some of the sun. And these became very much a social hub for the building, the gardens, you know, trying to encourage families back into high rise. So not only considering the environmental sustainability of the building, but also the social sustainability. How do we get families and children uh, back into living in high rise? And the idea was, um, again, while a utopian idea, pragmatic um, backgrounds influence this. So the idea being that... Um, you had a very um, compact, insulated block of units behind, the mechanical heat recovery and ventilation system working on a village basis, and then the south-facing atria, which would overheat, so the idea was to naturally ventilate it using a stack effect and to use the greenery and photovoltaics to help shade the space as well. Um, this next project is called the Solar Slice, uh, and these students were inspired by the context and by the site as well as Passive House. Um, as you can see, the site had this existing building behind. And this building is 88 Rector Street, quite a historic skyscraper, recently been renovated to be residential, has all these lovely sky gardens with great views. And the students thought, well, perhaps it's pretty selfish to build a 65-story building right in front of this to the south. You know, is it how appropriate is it to build a building that's considered environmental and which will have a, a negative impact on its surroundings, which will stop this building from get, gaining from views and from solar gain, etc. Um, so their idea, and I'm going to hurry up now very quickly, was to essentially create this chamfer within the building to allow light 
through onto the building behind, with a concept being that the building behind could become passive house compliant as well. Um, again, utopian, but again, uh, key structural ideas in this. I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. The last project I want to show is called the uh, Green Canyons. And the students here wanted to reconnect the site within the urban realm, uh, within to the World Trade Center, or into Battery Park, and you proposed a series of green tendrils spreading out from the site, kind of inspired by the New York High Line. Again, um, this is a site plan, ground floor plan. Uh, the idea was where these tendrils hit the building, they would create this large social atria uh, in the center with a stacked kind of creches, meeting rooms, and other key social spaces in the building. But surrounding this um, kind of big social um, exciting space were compact um, villages of passive house compliant units. This was a building in, in context. But again, while this was quite a utopian idea, the research behind it, the students actually examined how effective is our surface area to volume ratio as compared to a typical passive house. Examining where the insulation goes, and they actually ran this building through PHPP, much with the other research found it overheated a lot of the time, so 11% um, and 14%. So then they took it back to the drawing board and went and really in detail examined the facade where should the insulation go? How much glazing should be in there? How much shading should be in there? Into high levels of detail to examine how to reduce the amount of thermal breaks within the facade. And then ran it through PHPP again and found a significant reduction in overheating. But the overheating was still the challenge. Um, last couple of slides now. This was just our model we took down to EcoBuild in London uh, as part of the competition. And that last project you saw was uh, they came second in the international competition out of some 270 projects. Thank you very much.